Hey, good girl. 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 Hey, good girl.
Hey, good girl. Your ass better call somebody! Yo. 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 Yo, 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 yo. Welcome. Welcome. Um... Kerr, good to see you, Cognito Mishi. How are you guys? Reading stream, guys. We are going to be kick, kicking back up with 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. This is part two. We're going to be starting at chapter nine. All that's in the title. Um, as a recap, a lot of the beginning was very technical. They talked about the sightings of this great beast. And how by its sheer power and the things it feats it had accomplished and the distance of where it had been sighted in what time it had been sighted, it was unfathomable. Um, Professor Ahona, who is our main character, wrote a lengthy paper on the subject and became known as an expert of some sorts. And... Um, described it as a narwhal. A narwhal of unbelievable size. Oh, let me turn this. Let me turn this off. Okay. Uh, a narwhal, a uh, sea unicorn of unbelievable size. Now, they played... Um, they played it trying to catch this, but it, it went out of sight and disappeared for a long time. So when finally there was reports of it in the Pacific, they set the U.S. set together a Abraham USS Abraham Lincoln, which they had built for this purpose, outfitted with all of the top of the line fishing gear, whaling gear to go pursue this great beast. And they invited Professor Ahona um, to come along. Now, of course, he wanted to. Uh, he had just got done with a long, a long adventure and was looking to get home to France. But decided this was too big of an opportunity to pass up Conseil, who is uh, his manservant uh, of Flemish descent. Um, is a person so singular in nature of duty. Um, that they uh, he's just really there uh, and it was just like yeah we're doing it you know he just came along with him uh, they met some great people on the boat um, everybody was affixed at trying to find this thing after a while they did get worn down trying to chase this great monster because they could not find it and then when they found it finally as they were about to turn around the monster started playing like a cat and mouse game with them and never getting tired. Um, they tried to sneak up on it at one point after quite some attempt at, at, at straining the engines trying to keep up with this thing. They, they found it just f kind of floundering. When they got up close, Ned Land, the Canadian harpooner of, you know, of fame, if you will, took his shot and his harpoon just ricocheted off the side at which point the beast startled and and jumped to a flurry of action and moved away uh, and this caused a great 
floundering of the vessel. Uh, apparently, the, the rudder chain broke so that the boat could not steer, uh, but Ahana heard this secondhand because Ahana was thrown off of the boat. Kansei jumped in after Ahana, and after some great swimming, they heard Ned land on this floating island made of metal, which happened to be the great beast, and they found out that it's not a beast, but man-made. Now, this brought us almost to where we were caught up. But they were brought in to the vessel by some startled sailors who found them. The sailors have their own language, of which they, the three people have no clue of what it is. And between them, they speak a number of languages. They tried to relate their full story of everything that had happened to that point. There was a quite an enigmatic character who they could only assume was the captain of the vessel. Um, they made no such note, these sailors, these crew, this cap enigmatic captain, that they understood whatsoever all of the different languages of report that had been given to them by Ned Land, Kansei, and Professor Ahona. Um, and they let them go, but they did feed them. And they, I, I, oh, I'm sorry, they didn't let, let them go. They they left the room. And they um, let them to sleep, gave them food. So, I mean, like, it's obvious they're not trying to kill them, and they don't mean them, you know, ill will, so to say. But there's been no communication whatsoever, and that is where we are currently. So that's where we pick up with 20,000 leagues under the sea. What's up, Dez? Um, so let's go ahead and close the music down. Um, everybody get an exclamation point play in if you'd like. I'm going to start the timer. It's going to be two minutes. Ooh. Annie. Sorry, the alerts are off. The alerts are off. Let's, uh... <laughs> that gift is utterly adorable. It sure is. Uh, let's see. Where are we? Oh, yeah. Everything's off. I'd have to turn everything back on right now. I'm sorry, Annie. But thank you so much, Annie, uh, at 19 months. 19 freaking months. That's amazing. Uh, let's go ahead and run this stream readers battle. We're probably going to lose it, but I want to get it timed up with this with this uh, race. Cognito at 19 months as well. I was going to say, if if Annie's there, the chances are. <laughs> um, our, our, two, our two longest uh, longest tenured members, so to say. So I think I think all of the other founders have have missed a month here or there, you know? Not exactly sure. Uh, thank you guys so much. Sorry there's no alerts, but, you know, don't want to interrupt the, the reading. Uh, yeah, it looks like we are probably going to lose this, this one. Uh, but that's fine. It'll get us timed up with the half-hour race. So get your balls on the track, exclamation point play. Two minutes of going up on the clock right now. Two minutes on the clock right now. Type an exclamation point play. And we should be scaled down a little bit for our next Stream Raiders battle. Now, we went way early on that. Like, we would have won that. Um, 
But like I said, I just wanted to get it timed up roughly with our marbles. All right, so next one is up. So once again, we're about to meet the enigmatic captain, um, find out about this vessel that they thought was a narwhal um, of unbelievable proportions, size, strength. The proportion, size, and strength of this vessel were going to be amazing and superhuman regardless of whether it was um, machine or or beast so impressive either way the feet of the and just the proportions and strength and size and and locomotion of the the object so um, while they are incensed and and kind of crazy and captive right now they are also in a sense of wonder in all um, and let's go ahead and get going <laughs> choo 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 Des Lord thank you so much all right and we're starting the race too seven of you in there which with wit will be a about a half hour race good luck everybody Doc Obert, thanks for the bomber. I won't be saying um, the epics now, though. 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Our second reading stream. By Jules Verne. Chapter 9. Ned Land's Tempers. How long we slept, I do not know. But our sleep must have lasted long, for it rested us completely from our fatigues. I woke first. My companions had not moved and were still stretched in their corner. Hardly roused from my somewhat hard crouch, I felt my brain freed, my mind clear. I then began an attentive examination of our cell. Nothing was changed inside. The prison was still a prison. The prisoners, prisoners. However, the steward, during our sleep, had cleared the table. I breathed with difficulty. The heavy air seemed to oppress my lungs. Although the cell was large, we had evidently consumed a great part of the oxygen that it contained. Indeed, each man consumes in one hour the oxygen contained in more than 176 pints of air in this air, charged, as then, with a near, nearly equal quantity of carbonic acid, becomes unbreathable. It became necessary to renew the atmosphere of our prison and, no doubt, the hole in the submarine boat. That gave rise to a question in my mind. How would the commander of this floating dwelling place proceed? Would he obtain air by chemical means and getting by heat the oxygen contained in chlorate of potash? And in absorbing carbonic acid by caust caustic potash? Or a more convenient, economical, and consequently more probable alternative, would he be satisfied to rise and take breath at the surface of the water like a cetacean, and so renew for 24 hours the atmospheric provision? In fact, I was already obliged to increase my respirations to eke out of this cell the little oxygen it contained when suddenly I was refreshed by a current of pure air and perfumed with saline emanations. It was an invigorating sea breeze charged with iodine. I opened my mouth wide and my lungs saturated themselves with fresh particles. At the same time, I felt the boat rolling. The iron-plated monster had evidently just risen to the surface of the ocean to breathe after the fashion of whales. I found out from that the mode of ventilating the boat. When I inhaled this air freely, I sought the conduit pipe, which conveyed to us the beneficial whiff, and I was not long in finding it. Above the door was a ventilator, through which volumes of fresh air renewed the improv impoverished atmosphere of the cell. I was making my observations when Ned and Conseil awoke almost at the same time under the influence of this reviving air. They rubbed their eyes, stretched themselves, and were on their feet in an instant. Did Master sleep well? asked Conseil with his usual politeness. Very well, my brave boy, and you, Mr. Land. Soundly, Professor, but I don't know if I'm right or not, 
There seems to be a sea breeze. A seaman could not be mistaken, and I told the Canadian all that had passed during his sleep. Good, said he. That accounts for those roarings we heard when we supposed Narwhal sighted the Abraham Lincoln. Quite so, Master Land. It was taking breath. Only, Mr. Ahana, I have no idea what o'clock it is unless it is dinner time. Dinner time, my good fellow. Say rather breakfast time, for we certainly have begun another day. So, said Conseil, we have slept twenty-four hours? That is my opinion. I will not contradict you, replied Ned Land, but dinner or breakfast, the steward will be welcome whenever, he, whichever he brings. Master Land, we must conform to the rules on board, and I suppose our appetites are in advance of the dinner hour. That is just like you, friend Conseil, said Ned impatiently. You are never out of temper, always calm. You would return thanks before grace and die of hunger rather than complain. Time was getting on, and we were fearfully hungry. And this time the steward did not appear. It was rather too long to leave us if they were really had good intentions towards us. Ned Land, tormented by the cravings of hunger, got still more angry, and notwithstanding his promise, I dreaded an explosion when he found himself with one of the crew. For two hours more, Ned Land's temper increased. He cried, he shouted, but in vain. The walls were deaf. There was no sound to be heard in the boat. All was still as death. It did not move, for I should have felt the trembling motion of the hull under the influence of the screw. Plunged in the depths of the waters, it belonged no longer to earth. The silence was dreadful. I felt terrified. Conseil was calm. Ned Land roared. Just then a noise was heard outside. Steps sounded on the metal flags. The locks were turned, the door opened, and the steward appeared. Before I could rush forward to stop him, the Canadian had thrown him down and held him by the throat. The steward was choking under the grip of his powerful hand. Conseil was already trying to unclasp the harpooner's hand from his half-suffocated victim, and I, I was going to fly to the rescue when suddenly... I was nailed to the spot by hearing these words in French. Be quiet, Master Land, and you, Professor. Will you be so good as to listen to me? Chapter 10. The Man of the Seas It was the commander of the vessel who thus spoke. All the, at these words, Ned Land rose suddenly. The steward, nearly strangled, trotted out uh, on a sign from his master, but... Such was the power of the commander on board that not a gesture betrayed the resentment which this man must have felt towards the Canadian. Conseil, interested in spite of himself, I stupefied, awaited in silence the result of this scene. The commander, leaning against the corner of a table with his arms folded, scanned us with profound attention. Did he hesitate to speak? Did he regret the words which he had just spoken in French? One might also think so. After some moments of silence, which not one of us dreamed of breaking, Gentlemen, said he, in a calm and penetrating voice, I speak French, English, German, and Latin equally well. I could, therefore, have answered you at our first interview. But I wish to know you first, then to reflect. The story told by each one, entirely agreeing in the main points, convinced me of your identity. I know now that the chance has brought before me Monsieur Pierre Ahana, Professor of Natural History at the Museum of Paris, entrusted with a scientific mission abroad, Conseil, his servant, and Ned Land, of Canadian origin, harpooner on board the frigate Abraham Lincoln of the Navy of the United States of America. I bowed assent. It was not a question that the commander put to me. Therefore, there was no answer to be made. This man expressed himself with perfect ease, without any accent. His sentences were well turned, his words clear, and his fluency of speech remarkable, yet I did not recognize him as a fellow countryman. He continued the conversation in these terms. You have doubtless thought, sir, that I have delayed long in paying you this second visit. The reason is that your identity recognized. I wish to weigh maturely what part to act towards you. I have hesitated much. 
most annoying circumstances have brought you into the presence of a man who has broken all the ties of humanity. You have come to trouble my existence. Unintentionally, said I. Unintentionally, replied the stranger, raising his voice a little. Was it unintentionally that the Abraham Lincoln pursued me all over the seas? Was it unintentionally that you took passage in this frigate? Was it unintentionally that your cannon balls rebounded off the plating of my vessel? Was it unintentionally that Mr. Land struck me with his harpoon? I detected a restrained irritation in these words, but to these recriminations I had a very natural answer to make, and I made it. Sir, said I, no doubt you are ignorant of the discussions which have taken place concerning you in America and Europe. You do not know that divers' accidents caused by collisions with your submarine machine have excited public feeling in the two continents. I omit the hypothesis without number by which it was sought to explain the inexplicable phenomena of which you alone possess the secret. But you must understand that in pursuing you over the high seas of the Pacific, the Abraham Lincoln believed itself to be chasing some powerful sea monster of which it was necessary to rid the ocean at any price. A half-smile curled the lips of the commander, then, in a calmer tone. Monsieur Ahana, he replied, dare you affirm that your frigate would not as soon have pursued and cannonaded a submarine boat as a monster? This question embarrassed me, for certainly Captain Farragut might not have hesitated. He might have thought it his duty to destroy a contrivance of this kind, as he would a gigantic narwhal. You understand, then, sir? continued the stranger, that I have the right to treat you as enemies. I answered nothing purposely. For what good would it be to discuss such a proposition when force would destroy the best arguments? All right. One second, guys. I have to pause. <clears throat> I answered nothing, purposefully. For what good would it be to discuss such a proposition, when force could destroy the best arguments? I have hesitated some time, continued the commander. Nothing obliged me to show you hospitality. If I chose to separate myself from you, I should have no interest in seeing you again. I could place you upon the deck of this vessel, which has served you as a refuge. I could sink beneath the waters and forget that you ever existed. Would not that be my right? It might be the right of a savage, but not that of a civilized man. Professor, replied the commander quickly, I am not what you call a civilized man. I have done with society entirely, for reasons which I alone have the right of appreciating. I do not, therefore, obey its laws, and I desire you never to allude to them before me again. This was said plainly. A flash of anger and disdain kindled in the eyes of the unknown, and I had a glimpse of a terrible past in the life of this man. Not only had he put himself beyond the pale of human laws, but he had made himself independent of them, free in the strictest acceptation of the world, quite beyond their reach. Who then would dare to pursue him at the bottom of the sea when, on its surface, he defied all attempts made against him? What vessel could resist the shock of his submarine monitor? What curious, however thick, could withstand the blows of his spur? No man could demand from him an account of his action. God, if he believed in one, his conscience, if he had one, were the sole judges to whom he was answerable. These reflections crossed my mind rapidly, whilst the stranger personage was silent. Absorbed, as if wrapped up in himself, I regarded him with fear mingled with interest, as doubtless 
Oedipus regarded the Sphinx. After rather a long silence, the commander resumed the conversation. I have hesitated, said he, but I have thought that my interest might be reconciled with that pity to which every human being has a right. You will remain on board my vessel since fate has cast you here. You will be free in exchange for this liberty. I shall only impose one single condition. Your word of honor to submit to it will suffice. Speak, sir, I answered. I suppose this condition is one which a man of honor may accept. Yes, sir, it is this. It is possible that certain events unforeseen may oblige me to consign you to your cabins for some hours or some days, as the case may be. As I desire never to use violence, I expect from you, more than all the others, a passive obedience. In thus acting, I take all the responsibility. I acquit you entirely, for I make it an impossibility for you to see what ought not to be seen. Do you accept this condition? Then things took place on board which, to say the least, were singular and which ought not to be seen by people who were not placed beyond the pale of social laws. Amongst the surprises which the future was preparing for me, this might not be the least. We accept, I answered. Only I will ask your permission, sir, to address one question to you, one only. Speak, sir. You said that we should be free on board. Entirely. I ask you then, what do you mean by this liberty? Just the liberty to go, to come, to see, to observe even all that passes here, save under rare circumstances. The liberty, in short, which we enjoy ourselves, my companions, and I. It was evident that we did not understand one another. Pardon me, sir, I resumed. But this liberty is only what every prisoner has of pacing his prison. It cannot suffice us. It must suffice you, however. What? We must renounce for ever seeing our country, our friends, our relations again? Yes, sir. But to renounce that unendurable worldly yoke which men believe to be liberty is not perhaps so painful as you think. Well, exclaimed Ned Land, never will I give my word of honor not to try to escape. I did not ask you for your word of honor, Master Land, answered the commander coldly. Sir, I replied, beginning to get angry in spite of myself, you abuse your situation towards us. It is cruelty. No, sir. It is clemency. You are my prisoners of war. I keep you, when I could, by a word, plunge you into the depths of the ocean. You attacked me. You came to surprise a secret which no man in the world must penetrate, the secret of my whole existence. And you think that I am going to send you back to the world which must know me no more. Never. In retaining you, it is not you who my God, it is myself. These words indicated a resolution taken on the part of the commander against which no arguments would prevail. So, sir, I rejoined, you give us simply the choice between life and death. Simply. My friends, said I, to a question thus put, there is nothing to answer, but no word of honor binds us to the master of this vessel. None, sir, answered the unknown. Then in a gentler tone, he continued. Now, permit me to finish what I have to say to you. I know you, Monsieur Ahana. You and your companions will not, perhaps, have so much to complain of in the chance which has bound you to my fate. You will find amongst the books which are my favorite study the work which you have published on the depths of the sea. I have often read it. You have carried out your work as far as terrestrial science permitted you, but you do not know all, nor have you seen all. Let me tell you then, Professor, that you will not regret the time passed on board my vessel. You are going to visit the land of marvels. These words of the commander had a great effect upon me. I cannot deny it. My weak point was touched, and I forgot for a moment that the contemplation of these sublime subjects was not worth the loss of liberty. Besides, I trusted to the future to decide the grave question, so I contented myself with saying, By what name I, ought I address you? Sir, replied the sub-commander. 
I am nothing to you but Captain Nemo. And you and your companions are nothing to me but the passengers of the Nautilus. Captain Nemo called. A steward appeared. The captain gave him his orders in that strange language which I did not understand, then turning towards the Canadian and Conseil. A repast to which you in your cabin, said he. Be as so good as to follow this man. And now, Monsieur Ahana, our breakfast is ready. Permit me to lead the way. I am at your service, Captain. I followed Captain Nemo, and as soon as I had passed through the door, I found myself in kind of a passage lighted by electricity, uh, similar to the waist of a ship. After we had proceeded a dozen yards, a second door opened before me. I then entered a dining room, decorated and furnished in severe taste. High oaken sideboards inlaid with ebony stood at the two extremities of the room, and upon their shelves glittered china, porcelain, and glass of inestimable value. The plate on the table sparkled in the rays which the luminous ceiling shed around, while the light was tempered and softened by exquisite paintings. In the center of the room was a table richly laid out. Captain Nemo indicated the place I was to occupy. The breakfast considered, uh, consisted of a number of dishes, the contents of which were furnished by the sea alone, and I was ignorant of the nature um, and mode of preparation of some of them. I acknowledged that they were good, but they had a peculiar flavor, which I easily became accustomed to. These different elements appeared to me to be the rich in phosphorus, and I thought they must have a marine origin. Captain Nemo looked at me. I asked him no questions, but he guessed my thoughts and answered of his own accord the questions which I was burning to address him. The greater part of these dishes are unknown to you, he said to me. However, you may partake of them without fear. They are wholesome and nourishing. For a long time I have renounced the food of the earth and am never ill now. My crew, who are healthy, are fed on the same food. So, said I, all these eatables are the produce of the sea. Yes, Professor. The sea supplies all my wants. Sometimes I cast my nets in tow, and I draw them in ready to break. Sometimes I hunt in the midst of this element, which appears to be inaccessible to man, and quarry the game which dwells in my submarine forests. My flocks, like those of Neptune's old shepherds, graze fearlessly in the immense prairies of the ocean. I have a vast property there which I cultivate myself, and which is also sold by the hand of the creator of all things. I can understand perfectly, sir, that your nets furnish excellent fish for your table. I can understand also that you hunt aquatic game in your submarine forests, but I cannot understand at all how a particle of meat, no matter how small, can figure in your bill of fare. This, which you have be which you believe to be meat, Professor, is nothing more than filet of turtle. Here are also some dolphin livers, which you take to be ragout to pork. My cook is a clever fellow who excels in dressing these various products of the ocean. Taste all these dishes. Here is a preserve of holothuria, which a Malay would declare to be unrivaled in the world. Here is a cream, of which the milk has been furnished by Tsetetetesha and the sugar by which the fucus of the North Sea, and lastly, permit me to offer you some preserves of anemones, which is equal to that of the most delicious fruits. I tasted more from curiosity than as a connoisseur, while Captain Nemo enchanted me with his extraordinary stories. You like the sea, Captain? Yes, I love it. The sea is everything. It covers seven-tenths of the terrestrial globe. Its breath is pure and healthy. It is an immense desert where man is never lonely, for he feels like stirring on all sides. The sea is only the embodiment of a supernatural and wonderful existence. It is nothing but love and emotion. It is the living infinite, as one of your poets has said. In fact, Professor, Nature manifests herself in it by her three kingdoms, mineral, vegetable, and animal. The sea is the vast reservoir of nature. The globe began with the sea, so to speak, and who knows if it will not end with it. 
in it is supreme tranquility. The sea does not belong to despots. Upon its surface, men can still exercise unjust laws, fight, tear one another to pieces, and be carried away with terrestrial horrors, but at thirty feet below its level. Their reign ceases, their influence is quenched, and their power disappears. Ah, sir, live, live in the bosom of the waters. There only is independence. There I recognize no masters. There I am free. Captain Nemo suddenly became silent in the midst of his enthusiasm, by which he was quite carried away. For a few moments he paced up and down, much agitated. Then he became more calm, regained his accustomed coolness of expression, and turning towards me. Now, Professor, he said, if you wish to go over the Nautilus, I am at your service. Captain Nemo rose. I followed him. A double door contrived at the back of the dining room opened, and I entered a room equal in dimensions to that which I had just quitted. It was a library. High pieces of furniture of black violet ebony inlaid with brass supported upon their wide shelves a great number of books uniformly bound. They followed the shape of the room terminating at the lower part in huge divans covered with brown leather which were curved to afford the greatest comfort. Light, movable desks made to slide in and out at will allowed one to rest one book while reading. In the center stood an immense table covered with pamphlets, amongst which were some newspapers already of old date. The electric light flooded everything. It was shed from four unpolished globes half sunk in the volutes of the ceiling. I looked with real admir admiration at this room, so ingeniously fitted up, and I could scarcely believe my eyes. Captain Nemo, said I to my host, who had just thrown himself on one of the divans. This is a library which would do honor to more than one of the continental palaces, and I am absolutely astounded when I consider that it can follow you to the bottom of the seas. Where could one find greater solitude or silence, Professor? replied Captain Nemo. Did your study in the museum afford you such perfect quiet? No, sir, and I must confess that it is a very poor one after yours. You must have six or seven thousand volumes here. Twelve thousand, Monsieur Ahana. These are the only ties which bind me to the earth. But I have done with the world on the day when my Nautilus plunged for the first time beneath the waters. That day I bought my last volumes, my last pamphlets, my last papers, and from that time I wish to think no men longer write or think. These books, Professor, are at your service besides, and you can make use of them freely. I thanked Captain Nemo and went up to the shelves of the library. Works on science, morals, and literature abounded in every language, but I did not see one single work on political econ economy. That subject appeared to be strictly prescribed. Strange to say, all these works were irregularly arranged in whatever language they were written. In this medley proved that the captain of the Nautilus must have read indiscriminately the books which he took up by chance. Sir said I to the captain. I thank you for having placed this library at my disposal. It contains treasures of silence, and I shall profit by them. This room is not only a library, said Captain Nemo. It is also a smoking room. A smoking room? Then one may smoke on board. Certainly. Then, sir, I am forced to believe that you have kept up a communication with Havana. Not any answered the captain, accept this cigar, Monsieur Ahana, and though it does not come from Havana, you will be pleased with it if you are a connoisseur. I took the cigar which was offered me. Its shape recalled the London ones, but it seemed to be made of leaves of gold. I lighted it at a little brazier which was supported upon an elegant bronze stem and drew the first whiffs with the delight of a lover of smoking who has not smoked for two days. It is excellent, but it is not tobacco. No, said the captain. This tobacco comes neither from Havana nor from the east. It is kind of a seaweed, which in nicotine, which the sea provides me, but somewhat sparingly. At that, Captain Nemo opened a door which stood opposite to that which by I had entered the library, and I passed into an immense drawing room splendidly lighted. It was a vast four-sided room, 30 feet long, 18 wide, and 15 high. A luminous ceiling decorated with light utter busks 
shed a soft, clear light all over the marvels accumulated in this museum, for it was, in fact, a museum in which an intelligent and prodigal hand had gathered all the treasures of nature and art, with the artistic confusion which distinguishes a painter's studio. We'll pause there a second. Fifty-seven and forty-seven for our winners. Next race. If you would like to get in on the marbles, play to play. Again, it will be a half hour race. Yeah, the hugs are not on. Nothing is on, really. Almost nothing is on. In fact, that command, which I just turned on, I turned back off right now. Um, yes. All right. Let's see. Twitch doesn't hate you. Okay. Get your balls on the track. Get your balls on the track. Two minutes are up on the clock. Bonai is out, and the next map is started. Get your balls on the track. And get your cocks on the map. Actually, I do have a quest to play cocks. Thank you for your units, and good luck on the next battle. You got uh, one minute left to get into the battle. Well, a little over one minute. I mean, to get in the race. So, um, basically, Captain Nemo has told them that they're free to do what they want, but if he tells them they need to be ref confined to quarters at any random times, he requests that they please do so. Other than that, they have the run of the ship, but they cannot leave the ship. Um... He has sent Ned Land and Conseil out to their own repast. Well, he uh, brings Professor Ahona to kind of show off a bit. Uh, if nothing, if not for any other reason, then he has things that he knows that the professor will appreciate. He has a great dining table with an amass and a varied rays of foods, and he has these. Uh, this library, which is just amazing. Uh, th this is the second chapter that we're in. The first one was pretty short, though. It was just, I mean, literally Captain Nemo walking in. Actually, no, Captain Nemo didn't even come in until this chapter, so, yeah. Um, so it's really, well, I mean, we're really, we're right there. Though I, I do want to highlight, and let's go follow a ball there. Uh, the the bookshelves they look I, I I imagine they would be amazing black violet ebony inlaid with brass black and purple ebony inlaid with brass supported the wide shelves of a great number of books hmm. that sounds sexy. All right. Um, I'm going to read the last chapter again. Let's go. Mm. The last paragraph, I'm sorry. They are exiting opposite the, from where they came into the library. It was a vast four-sided room, 30 feet long, 18 wide, and 15 high. A luminous ceiling, decorated with light arabesques, shed a soft, clear light all over the marvels accumulated in this museum, for it was, in fact, a museum, in which an intelligent and prodigal hand had gathered all the treasures of nature and art, with the artistic confusion which distinguishes a painter's studio. Thirty first-rate pictures, uniformly framed, separated by bright drapery, ornamented the walls, which were hung with tapestry of severe design. 
I saw works of great value, the greater part of which I admired in special collections of Europe and in the exhibitions of paintings. The several schools of the old masters were represented by a Madonna of Raphael, a virgin of Leonardo da Vinci, a nymph of Correggio, a woman of Titan, an adoration of Veronese, an assumption of Murillo, a portrait of Holbein, a monk of Velasquez, a martyr of Ribera, a pair of Rubens, too, two Flemish landscapes of ten years, three little genre pictures of Gerard Do, Metsu, and Paul Potter, two specimens of Gericault and Proutan, and some sea pieces of Bacuisson and Vernet. Among the works of modern painters were pictures with the signatures of Delacroix, Ingres, de Camps, Troyon, Massonier, Daubigny, etc., and some admirable statues in marble and bronze after the first antique models stood upon pedestals in the corners of this magnificent museum. Amazement, as the captain of the Nautilus had predicted, had already begun to take possession of me. Professor, said the strange man, you must excuse the unceremonious way in which I receive you and the disorder of this room. Sir, I answered, without seeking to know who you are, I recognize in you an artist. And I'm not sure, nothing more, sir. Formerly, I loved to collect these beautiful works created by the hand of man. I sought them greedily and ferreted them out indefatigably. Indefatigably. And I have been able to bring together some objects of great value. These are the last souvenirs of that world which is dead to me. In my eyes, your modern artists are already old. They have two or three thousand years of existence. I confound them in my own mind. Masters have no age. And these musicians, said I, pointing out the works of Weber, Rossini, Mozart, Beethoven, Haydn, Meyerbeer, Harold, Wagner, Auber, Gounod, and a number of others scattered over a large model piano organ, which occupied one of the panels of the drawing room. These musicians, replied Captain Nemo, are the contemporaries of Orpheus, for in the memory of the dead, all chronological differences are effaced, and I am dead, Professor, as much dead as those of your friends who are sleeping six feet under the earth. Captain Nemo was silent and seemed lost in profound reverie. I contemplated him with great interest analyzing in silence the strange expression on his countenance. Leaning on his elbow against an angle of a costly mosaic table, he no longer saw me. He had forgotten my presence. I did not disturb this reverie and continued my observation of the curiosities which enriched this drawing room. Under elegant glass case, fixed by copper rivets, were classified and labeled the most precious productions of the sea which had ever been presented to the eye of a naturalist. My delight as a professor may be conceived. The division containing the zoophytes presented the most curious specimens of the two groups of polypi and uh, echinodermes. In the first group, the tubipores were gorgons, argon like a fan, arranged like a fan, soft sponges of Syria, Isis of the Molochos, pinnatules, and admirable vir virgularia of the Norwegian seas, variegated ubulare, alcianeri, a whole series of madripores, which my master Milne Edwards has so cleverly classified, amongst which I remark some wonderful uh, flabellinae aquilinae of the island of Bourbon. This Neptune's car of the Antilles, superb varieties of corals, in short, every species of those curious polypi of which the entire islands are formed, which will one day become continents, of the Echidodermes, remarkable for their coating of spines, asteri, sea stars, pantacrinae, comatules, asterophons, echini, holothuri, etc., represented individually a complete collection of this group. probably just got a lot of those wrong. A somewhat nervous uh, conchiologist would have certainly fainted before more other numerous cases in which were classified the specimens of mollusks. It was a collection of inestimable value which time fails me to describe minutely. 
Amongst these specimens, I will quote from memory only the elegant royal hammerfish of the Indian Ocean, whose regular white spots stood out brightly on a red and brown ground. An imperial spondyle, bright colored, bristling with spines, a rare specimen in the U European museums, I estimated its value at no less than 1,000 pounds. A common hammerfish of the seas of New Holland, which is only procured with great difficulty. Exotic Bucardia of Senegal, fragile white bivalve shells, which a breath might shatter like a soap bubble. Several variety of, of Aspergillum of Java, a kind of calcareous tube edged with leafy folds and much debated by amateurs. A whole series of trochi, some of a greenish yellow found in the American, excuse me, found in the American seas, other a reddish brown natives of Australian waters, others from the Gulf of Mexico, remarkable for the imbricated shell, Stellari found in the southern seas, and last and rarest of all, the magnificent spur of New Zealand and every description of delicate and fragile shells to which science has given appropriate names. Apart, in separate compartments, were spread out chaplets of pearls of the greatest beauty, which reflected the electric light in little sparks of fire, pink pearls, torn from the Pina Marina of the Red Sea, green pearls from the Haleotide Iris, yellow, blue, black pearls, the curious productions of the divers mollusks of every ocean, and certain mussels of the watercourses of the north, and lastly, several specimens of inestimable value which had been gathered from the rarest pinatines. Pintadines. Some of these pearls were larger than a pigeon's egg, and worth as much, and more than that which the traveler Tavernier sold to the Shah of Persia for three millions, and surpassed the one in the possession of the Imam of Muscat, which I believed to be unrivaled in the world, which I had believed to be unrivaled in the world. Therefore, to estimate the value of this collection was simply impossible. Captain Nemo must have expended millions in the acquirement of these various specimens, and I was thinking what source he could have drawn from to have been able to thus gratify his fancy for collecting when I was interrupted by these words. You are examining my shells, Professor. Unquestionably, they must be interesting to a naturalist, but for me they have a far greater charm, for I have collected them all with my own hand and there is not a sea on the face of the globe which has escaped my researches. I can understand, Captain, the delight of wandering about in the midst of such riches. You are one of those who have collected the treasures themselves. No museum in Europe possesses such a collection of the produce of the ocean, but if I exhaust all my admiration upon it, I shall have none left for the vessel which carries it. I do not wish to pry into your secrets, but I must confess that this Nautilus with the motive power which is confined in it, the contrivances which enable it to be worked, the powerful agent which propels it, all excite my curiosity to the highest pitch. I see suspended on the walls of this room instruments of whose use I am ignorant. You will find the same instruments in my own room, Professor, where I shall have much pleasure in explaining their use to you. But first, come and inspect the cabin which is set apart for your own use. You must see how you will be accommodated on board the Nautilus. I followed Captain Nemo, who, by one of the doors opening from each panel of the drawing room, regained their waist. He conducted me towards the bow, and there I found not a cabin, but an elegant room with a bed, dressing table, and several other pieces of furniture. I could only thank my host. Your room adjoins mine, said he, opening a door, and mine opens into the drawing room, that we have just quitted. I entered the captain's room. It had a severe, almost monkish aspect. A small iron bedside, a table, some articles for the toilet, the whole lighted by a skylight, no comforts, the strictest, strictest necessaries only. Captain Nemo pointed to a seat. Be so good as to sit down, he said. I seated myself, and he begun thus. End of chapter 10. Chapter 11, All by Electricity. Sir, said Captain Nemo, 
showing the instruments hanging on the walls of his room. Here are the contrivances required for the navigation of the Nautilus. Here, as in the drawing room, I have them always under my eyes, and they indicate my position and exact direction in the middle of the ocean. Some are known to you, such as the thermometer, which gives the internal temperature of the Nautilus, the barometer, which indicates the weight of the air and foretells the changes of the weather, the hygrometer, which marks the dryness of the atmosphere, the storm glass, the contents of which, by decomposing, announce the approach of tempests, the compass which guides my course, the sextant which shows the latitude by the altitude of the sun, chronometers by which I calculate the longitude and glasses for day and night, which I use to examine the points of the horizon when the Nautilus rises to the surface of the waves. These are the usual nautical instruments, I replied, and I know how to use them, but these others, no doubt, Answer to the particular requirements of the Nautilus. This dial with the movable needle is a manometer, is it not? It is actually a manometer, but by communication with the water, whose external pressure it indicates, it gives our depth at the same time. Are these other instruments, uh, the use of which I cannot guess? Here, Professor, I ought to give you some explanations. Will you be kind enough to listen to me? He was silent for a few moments, and then he said, There is a powerful agent, obedient, rapid, easy, which conforms to every use and reigns supreme on board my vessel. Everything is done by means of it. It lights it, warms it, and is the soul of mechanical apparatus. This agent is electricity. Electricity? I cried in surprise. Yes, sir. Nevertheless, Captain, you possess an extreme rapidity of movement which does not agree with the power of electricity. Until now, its dynamic force has remained under restraint and has only been able to produce a small amount of power. Professor, said Captain Nemo, my electricity is not everybody's. You know what seawater is composed of. In a thousand grams are found 96.5% of water and about two to two thirds percent of chloride of sodium. Then, in a smaller quantity, chlorides of magnesium and of potassium, bromide of magnesium, sulfate of magnesia, sulfate and carbonate of lime. You see, then, that chloride of sodium forms a large part of it. So it is this sodium that I extract from seawater and of which I compose my ingredients. I owe all to the ocean. It produces electricity, and electricity gives heat, light, motion, and word life to the Nautilus. But not the air you breathe. Oh, I could manufacture the air necessarily for my consumption, but it is useless because I go up to the surface of the water when I please. However, if electricity does not furnish me with air to breathe, it works at least powerful pumps that are stored in spacious reservoir, which enable me to prolong at need, and as long as I will, my stay in the depths of the sea. It gives a uniform and unintermittent light which the sun does not. Now look at this clock. It is electrical and goes with the regularity that defies the best chronometers. I have divided it into 24 hours like the Italian clocks, because for me there is neither day, nor sun, nor moon, but only that factitious light that I take with me to the bottom of the sea. Look, just now it is 10 o'clock in the morning. Exactly. Another application of electricity, the dial hanging in front of us, indicates the speed of the Nautilus. An electric thread puts it in communication with the screw, and the needle indicates the real speed. Look, now we are spinning along with a uniform speed of 15 miles an hour. It is marvelous, and I see, Captain, you were right to make use of this agent that takes the place of wind, water, and steam. We have not finished, Monsieur Arnaud. If you follow me, we will examine the stern of the Nautilus. Really, I knew already the interior part of the submarine boat, of which this is the exact division, starting from the ship's head. The dining room, five yards long, separated from the library by a watertight partition. The library, five yards long. The large drawing room, ten yards long, separated from the captain's room by a second watertight partition. The said room, five yards in length, mine, two and a half yards, and lastly, a reservoir of air, seven and a half yards, that extended to the bows. Total length, 35 yards, or 105 feet. The partitions had doors that were shut hermetically by means of India rubber instruments, and they ensured the safety of the Nautilus in case of a leak. 
I followed Captain Nemo through the waist and arrived at the center of the boat. There was a sort of well that opened between two partitions. An iron ladder, fastened with an iron hook to the partition, led to the upper end. I asked the captain what the ladder was used for. It leads to the small boat, he said. What? You have a boat? I exclaimed in surprise. Of course, an excellent vessel, light and insubmersible, that serves either as a fishing or as a pleasure boat. But then, when you wish to embark, you are obliged to come to the surface of the water. Not at all. This boat is attached to the upper part of the hull of the Nautilus and occupies a cavity uh, made for it. It is decked quite watertight and held together by solid boats. This ladder leads to a manhole made in the hull of the Nautilus that corresponds with a similar hole made in the side of the boat. By this double opening, I get into the small vessel. They shut the one belonging to the Nautilus. I shut the other by means of screw pressure. I undo the bolts, and the little boat goes up to the surface of the sea with prodigious rapidity. I then open the panel of the bridge, carefully shut till then. I mast it, hoist my sail, take my oars, and I am off. But how do you get back on board? I do not come back, Monsieur Ahana. The Nautilus comes to me. By your orders? By my orders. An electric thread connects us. I telegraph to it, and that is enough. Really? I said, astonished at these marvels. Nothing can be more simple. After having passage by the cage of the staircase that led to the platform, I saw a cabin six feet long, in which Conseil and Ned Land, enchanted with their repast, were devouring it with avidity. Then a door opened into a kitchen nine feet long, situated between the large storerooms. Their electricity, better than gas itself, did all the cooking. The streams under the furnaces gave out to the sponges of platina a heat, which was regularly kept up and distributed. They also heated a distilling apparatus, which, by evaporation, furnished excellent drinkable water. Near this kitchen was a bathroom comfortably furnished with hot and cold water taps. Next to the kitchen was a berth room of the vessel, 16 feet long. But the door was shut, and I could not see the management of it, which might have given me an idea of the number of men employed on board the Nautilus. At the bottom was a fourth partition that separated this office from an engine room. A door opened, and I found myself in the compartment where Captain Nemo, certainly an engineer of a very high order, had arranged his locomotive machinery. This engine room, clearly lighted, did not measure less than 65 feet in length. It was divided into two parts. The first contained the material for producing electricity, and the second, the machinery that connected it with the screw. I examined it with great interest in order to understand the machinery of the Nautilus. You see, said the captain, I use Bonson's contrivances, not roof course. Those would have been powerful enough. Bonson's are fewer in number, but strong and large, which experiences prove to be the best. The electricity produces passes forward where it works by electromagnets of great size on a system of levers and cogwheels that transmit the movement to the axle of the screw. This one, the diameter of which is 19 feet and the thread 23 feet, performs about 120 revolutions in a second. And you get that? A speed of 50 miles an hour. I have seen the Nautilus maneuver before the Abraham Lincoln and have my own ideas as to its speed, but that is not enough. We must see where we go. We must be able to direct it to the right, to the left, above, below. How do you get to the great depths where you find an increasing resistance which is rated by hundreds of atmospheres? How do you return to the surface of the ocean? And how do you maintain yourselves in the requisite medium? Am I asking too much? Not at all, Professor, replied the captain with some hesitation. Since you may never leave this submarine boat, come into the salon. It is our usual study, and there you will learn all you want to know about the Nautilus. End of chapter 11. Chapter 12. Some Figures. A moment after we were seated on a divan in the saloon smoking, the captain showed me a sketch that gave me the plan section and elevation of the Nautilus. Then he began his description in these words. Here, Mr. Ahuna, are the several dimensions of the boat you are in. 
It is an elongated cylinder with conical ends. It is very like a cigar in shape, a shape that already adopted in London in several constructions of the same sort. The length of the cylinder, which stem to stern, is exactly 232 feet, and its maximum breadth is 26 feet. It is not built quite like your long voyage steamers, but its lines are sufficiently long and its curves prolonged enough to allow the water to slide off easily and oppose no obstacle to its passage. These two dimensions enable you to obtain by simple calculation the surface and cubic contents of the Nautilus. Its area measures 6,032 feet and its contents about 1,500 cubic yards. That is to say, when completely immersed, it displaces 50,000 feet of water or weighs 1,500 tons. When I made the plans for this submarine vessel, I meant that nine-tenths should be submerged, consequently. It only ought to displace nine-tenths of its bulk, that is to say, only to weigh that number of tons. I ought not, therefore, to have exceeded that weight, constructing it on the aforesaid mid-dimensions. The Nautilus is composed of two hulls, one inside, the other outside, joined by T-shaped irons, which render it very strong. Indeed, owing to this cellular arrangement, it resists like a block, as if it were solid. Its sides cannot yield, it coheres spontaneously, and not by the closeness of its rivets and the homogeneity of its construction, due to the perfect union of the materials, enables it to defy the roughest seas. These two halls are composed of steel plates whose density is from 0.7 to 0.8 that of water. The first is not less than two inches and a half thick and weighs 394 tons. The second envelope, the keel, 20 inches high and 10 thick, weighs alone 62 tons. The engine, the ballast, the several accessories and apparatus appendages, the partitions and bulkhead weigh 961.62 tons. Do you follow all of this? I do. Then, when the Nautilus is afloat, under these circumstances, one-tenth is out of the water. Now, if I have made reservoirs of size equal to this tenth, or capable of holding 150 tons, and if I filled them with water, the boat, weighing then 1,507 tons, will be completely immersed. This would happen, Professor. Those reservoirs are in the lower part of the Nautilus. I turn on taps, and I fill, and the vessel sinks that has just been level with the surface. Well, Captain, but we now come with the real difficulty. I can understand your rising to the surface, but diving below the surface does... Not your submarine contrivance encounter a pressure, and consequently undergo an upward thrust of one atmosphere for every thirty feet of water? Just about fifteen pounds per square inch? Just so, sir. Then unless you quite feel the Nautilus, I do not see how you draw it down to those depths. Professor, you must confound stacks with dynamics, or you will be exposed to grave errors. There is very little labor spent in attaining the lower regions of the ocean, for all bodies have a tendency to sink. When I wanted to find out the necessary increase of weight to sink the Nautilus, I had only to calculate the reduction of volume that seawater acquires according to the depth. That is evident. Now, if water is not absolutely incompressible, it is at least capable of very slight compression. Indeed, after the most recent calculations, this reduction is only 0 .000436 of an atmosphere for each 30 feet of depth. If we want to sink 3,000 feet, I should keep account of a reduction of bulk under a pressure equal to that of a column of water of a thousand feet. That calculation is easily verified. Now I have supplementary reservoirs capable of holding a hundred tons. Therefore I can sink to a considerable depth. When I wish to rise to the level of the sea, I let only let off the water and empty all the reservoirs if I want the Nautilus to emerge from the tenth part of her total capacity. I had nothing to object to these reasonings. I admit your calculations, Captain, I replied. I should be wrong to dispute them. Such daily experience confirms them, but I foresee a real difficulty in the way. What, sir? When you are about 1,000 feet depth, the walls of the Nautilus bear a pressure of 100 atmospheres, if thin. Just now, as you were to empty the supplemental reservoirs to lighten the vessel and go to the surface, the pumps must overcome the pressure of 100 atmospheres, which is 1,500 pounds per square inch, from that a power... That the electricity alone can give, said the captain hastily. I repeat, sir, that the dynamic power of my engines is almost infinite. 
The pumps of the Nautilus have an enormous power, as you must have observed when the jets of water burst like a torrent upon the Abraham Lincoln. Besides, I use subsidiary reservoir only to obtain a mean depth of 750 to 1,000 fathoms, and that with a view of managing my machines. Also, when I have a mind to visit the depths of the ocean five or six miles below the surface, I make use of a slower, but not less infallible means. What are they, Captain? That involves my telling you how the Nautilus has worked. I am impatient to learn. It's to steer this boat to starboard or port to turn, in a word, following a horizontal plan. I use an ordinary rudder fixed on the back of the stern post, and with one wheel and some tackle to steer by. But I also make the Nautilus rise and sink and sink and rise by a vertical movement by means of two inclined planes fastened to its side, opposite the center of flotation planes that move in every direction and that are worked by powerful levels from the interior. If the planes are kept parallel with the boat, it moves horizontally, if slanted, the Nautilus according to this inclination and under the influence of the screw either sinks diagonally or rises diagonally as it suits me. And even if I wish to rise more quickly to the surface, I ship the screw and the pressure of the water causes the Nautilus to rise vertically like a balloon filled with hydrogen. Bravo, Captain, but how can the steersman follow the route in the middle of the waters? The steersman is been placed in a glazed box that is raised above the hull of the Nautilus and furnished with lenses. Are these lenses capable of resisting such pressure? Perfectly. Glass, which breaks at the blow, is nevertheless capable of offering considerable resistance. During some experiments of fishing by Sir Electrical Light in 1864 in the Northern Seas, we saw plates less than a third of an inch resist a pressure of 16 atmospheres. Now the glass that I use is not less than 30 times thicker. Granted, but after all, in order to see, the light must exceed the darkness, and in the midst of the darkness in the water, how can you see? Behind a steersman cage is placed a powerful electric reflector, the rays from which light up the sea for half a mile in front. Ah, bravo, bravo, Captain! Now I can account for this phosphorescence in the supposed narwhal that puzzled us so. I now ask you if boarding of the Nautilus and of the Scotia that has made such a noise has been the result of a chance recontra? Quite accidental, sir. I was sailing only one fathom below the surface of the water when the shock came. It had no bad result. None, sir. But now, about your recontra with the Abraham Lincoln. Professor, I am sorry for one of the best vessels in the American Navy, but they attacked me, and I was bound to defend myself. I contented myself, however, with putting the frigate hors de combat, so she will have difficulty in getting repaired at she will not have any difficulty in getting repaired at the next port. Pause there. Ninety-four, seventy-seven, sixty. GG's Romano. Next race, play to play. Get him on, get him on, get him in, get him in, get him on, get him on, get him in, get him in, get him in, get him on, get him on, get him in. If you would like to race in the marble race, do an exclamation point play to get your balls onto the track. So, uh, he's basically saying that, you know, he's explaining the size and scope of the Nautilus and how it does what it does. Um, and also telling him that uh, any interactions he had had before the Abraham Lincoln were by sheer accident, uh, accidental connection with any ships or anything like that, and that with the Abraham Lincoln he had contented himself to render it ineffective to follow him, uh, but had not tried to do it any long-lasting damage. Lant, Annie, and Doc Obrin get the bona. Captain Nemo's library must be on a Kindle. <laughs> it's a lot of a lot of books. All right, guys, get your balls on the track, your cocks on the map. As a famous poet once said, starting the timer, two minutes. It's a pretty decent points for the last one.
Um, global Twitch plays, you cannot put links in the chat. We do not allow the, the links. Um, so, sorry that I, you know, won't be able to see what that is. All I see is three dots. Do an exclamation point play if you'd like to get into the race. And unfortunately, Global Twitch plays. We are doing the reading stream today, so no music. But I will, whenever we finish music, I could, I could do that. Um, we're gonna because we read for about two hours, so about one more hour, about one more hour of reading, and then we'll do some music and some some balls and stuff, you know. But but uh, good to see you. Good to see you. We're reading Jules Verne's um, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Let's continue. I'm starting the clock. Oh, no, I already started the clock. There's 40 seconds left. Seven people in right now. So if you want to type out the song Global Twitch Plays, we, we, we'll be able to see it, but I cannot see a link. All I see is three dots. I'm trying to pr protect everybody from uh, anybody that would randomly come in and do links. Ah, Commander, your Nautilus is certainly a marvelous boat. Yes, Professor, and I love it as if it were part of myself. If danger threatens one of your vessels on the ocean, the first impression is the feeling of an abyss above and below. On the Nautilus, men's hearts never failed him. No defects to be afraid of, for the double shell is as firm as iron. No rigging to attend to, no sails for the wind to carry away, no boilers to burst, no fire to fear. For the vessel is made of iron, not of wood. No coal to run short, for electricity is the only mechanical agent. No collision to fear, for it alone swims in deep water. No tempest to brave, for when it dies below water, it reaches absolute tranquility. There, sir, that is the perfection of vessels. And if it is true that the engineer has more confidence in the vessel than the builder, and the builder than the captain himself, you understand the trust I repose in the Nautilus, for I am at once captain, builder, and engineer. But how could you construct this wonderful Nautilus in secret? Each separate portion, Monsieur Ahana, was bought from different parts of the globe. The keel was forged at Croissant, the shaft of the screw at Pin and Company's London, the iron plates of the hall at Laird's of Liverpool, the screw itself at Scott's at Glasgow. The reservoirs were made by Kale and Company at Paris. The engine by Krupp in Prussia. Its beak in Motala's workshop in Sweden. Its mathematical instruments by Hart Brothers of New York, etc. And each of these people had my orders under different names. But these parts had to be put together and arranged. Professor, I had set up my workshops upon a desert island in the ocean. There my workmen, that is to say, the brave men that I instructed and educated, have myself put together the Nautilus. Then, when the work was finished, fire destroyed all traces of our proceedings on the island that I could have jumped over if I liked. Then the cost of this vessel is great, Monsieur Arenard. An iron vessel costs 145 pounds per ton. Now the Nautilus weighs 1,500. It came, therefore, to 67,500 pounds, and 80,000 pounds more for fitting it up, and about 200,000 pounds with the works of art and collections it contains. One last question, Captain Nemo. Ask it, Professor. You are rich? Immensely rich, sir. And I could, without missing it, pay the national debt of France. I stared at the singular person who spoke thus. Was he playing upon my credulity? The future would decide that. End of chapter 12. Chapter 13, The Black River. Oh, you know what? I want to get a screenshot of this.
Chapter 13, The Black River. The portion of the terrestrial globe which is covered by water is estimated at upwards of 80 millions of acres. This fluid mass comprises 2,250,000,000 of cubic miles, forming a spherical body of a diameter of 60 leagues, the weight of which would be three quintillions of tons. To comprehend the meaning of these figures, it is necessary to observe that a quintillion is to a billion as a billion is to unity. In other words, there are as many billions in a quintillion as there are units in a billion. This mass of fluid is equal to about the quantity of water which would be discharged by all the rivers of the earth in 40,000 years. During the geological epochs, the igneous period succeed, uh, succeeded to the aqueous. The ocean originally prevailed everywhere. Then, by degrees, in the Silurian period, the tops of the mountains began to appear. The islands emerged, then disappeared in partial deluges, reappeared, became settled, formed continents, till at length the earth became geographically arranged as we see in the present day. That solid had rested from the liquid 37,657 square miles, equal to 12,960 millions of acres. The shape of continents allows us to divide the waters into five great portions, the Arctic or Frozen Ocean, the Antarctic or Frozen Ocean, the Indian, the Atlantic, and the Pacific Oceans. The Pacific Ocean extends from north to south between the two polar circles, and from east to west between Asia and America, over an extent of 145 degrees of longitude. It's the quietest of seas. Its currents are broad and slow. It has medium tides and abundant rain. Such was the ocean that my fate destined me first to travel over under these strange conditions. Sir, said Captain Nemo, we will, if you please, take our bearings and fix the start point of this voyage. It is a quarter to twelve. I will go up again to the surface. The captain pressed an electric clock three times. Three pu the pumps began to drive the water from the tanks. The needle of the manometer marked by the different pressure, the ascent of the Nautilus, then it stopped. We have arrived, said the captain. I went to the central staircase, which opened on the platform, clambered up the iron steps, and found myself on the upper part of the Nautilus. The platform was only three feet out of the water. The front and back of the Nautilus was that of that spindle shape which caused it justly to be compared to a cigar. I noticed that its iron plates, slightly overlaying each other, resembled the shell which closed the bodies of our large terrestrial reptiles. It explained to me how natural it was, in spite of all glasses, that this boat should have take, been taken for a marine animal. Toward the middle of the platform, the longboat, half buried in the hull of the vessel, formed a slight excrescence. Fore and aft rose two cages of medium height with inclined sides and partly closed by thick lenticular glasses. One destined for the steersman, who directed the Nautilus, the other containing a brilliant lantern to give light on the road. The sea was beautiful, the sky pure. Scarcely could the long vehicle feel the broad undulations of the ocean. A light breeze from the east rippled the surface of the waters. The horizon, free from fog, made observation easy. Nothing was in sight. Not a quicksand, not an island, a vast desert. Captain Nemo, by the help of the sextant, took the altitude of the sun, which ought also to give the latitude. He waited for some movements, moments till the disc touched the horizon. Whilst taking observations, not a muscle moved. The instrument could have not been more motionless in the hand of marble. Twelve o'clock, sir. When you like. I cast a look upon the sea, slightly yellowed by the Japanese coast, and descended to the saloon. And now, sir, I leave you to your studies. Of our course is east-northeast. Our depth is twenty-six fathoms. Here are maps on a large scale by which you may follow it. The saloon is at your disposal, and with your permission, I will retire. Captain Nemo bowed, and I remained alone, lost in all thoughts, all bearing on the commander of the Nautilus. For a whole hour was I deep in these reflections, seeking to pierce the mystery so interesting in me. Then my eyes fell upon the vast planisphere spread upon the table, and I placed my finger on the very spot where the given latitude and longitude crossed. The sea had its large rivers like the continents. There are special currents known by their temperature and their color. The most remarkable of these is known by the name of the Gulf Stream. Science has decided on the globe of direction 
science has decided on the globe the direction of five principal currents, one in the North Atlantic, a second in the South, a third in the North Pacific, a fourth in the South, and a fifth in the Southern Indian Ocean. It is even probable that a sixth current existed at one time or another in the Northern Indian Ocean when the Caspian and Aral Seas formed but one vast sheet of water. At this point, indicated on the planisphere, one of these currents was rolling. The Kuroskiva of the Japanese, the Black River, which, leaving the Gulf of Bengal, where it is warmed by the perpendicular rays of the tropical sun, crosses the streets of Malacca across the coasts of Asia, turns into the North Pacific to the Aleutian Islands, carrying with the trunks of camphor trees and other indigenous pro productions, and edging the waves of the ocean with the pure indigo of its warm water. It was this current that the Nautilus was to follow. I followed it with my eye, saw it lose itself in the vastness of the Pacific, and felt myself drawn with it when Ned Land and Conseil appeared at the door of the saloon. My two brave companions remained petrified at the sight of these wonders spread before them. "'Where are we? Where are we?' explained the Canadian. "'In the museum at Quebec?' "'My friends,' I answered, making a sign for the inter. "'You are not in Canada, but on board the Nautilus, fifty yards below this level of the sea.' "'But, Monsieur Ahana, can you tell me how many men there are on board? Ten, twenty, fifty, a hundred? "'I cannot answer you, Mr. Land. It is better to abandon for all the time the idea of seizing the Nautilus or escaping it. This ship is a masterpiece of modern industry, and I should not be sorry, and I should be sorry not to have seen it. Many people would accept this situation forced upon us, if only to move amongst such wonders. So be quiet, and let us try and see what passes around us.' "'See!' Si exclaimed the harpooner, but we can see nothing in this iron prison. We are walking. We are sailing blindly. Ned Land had scarcely pronounced these words when all was suddenly darkness. The luminous ceiling was gone, and so rapidly that my eyes received a painful impression. We remained mute, not stirring and not knowing what surprise awaited us, whether agreeable or disagreeable. A sliding noise was heard. One would have said that panels were working at the sides of the Nautilus. It is the end of the end, said Ned Land. Suddenly, light broke at the end, at each side of the saloon, through two oblong openings. The liquid mass appeared vividly lit up by the electric gleam. Two crystal plates separated us from the sea. At first, I trembled at the thought that this frail partition might break, but strong bands of copper bound them, giving an almost infinite power of resistance. The sea was distinctly visible for a mile all around the Nautilus. What a spectacle! What pen can describe it? Who could paint the effects of the light through these transparent sheets of water and the softness and successive gradations from the lower to the superior strata of the ocean? We know the transparency of the sea and that its clearness is far beyond that of rock water. The mineral and organic substances which it holds in suspension heightens its transparency. In certain parts of the ocean at the Antilles, under 75 fathoms of water can be seen with surprising clearness a bed of sand. The penetrating power of the solar rays does not seem to cease for a depth of 150 fathoms, but in the middle fluid traveled over by the Nautilus, the electric brightness was produced even in the bosoms of the waves. It was no longer luminous water, but liquid light. On each side, a window opened into this unexplored abyss. The obscurity of the saloon showed to advantage the brightness outside, and we looked out as if this pure crystal had been the glass of an immense aquarium. You wish to see, Ned, friend Ned? Well, now you see. Curious, curious, muttered the Canadian, who, forgetting his ill temper, seemed to submit to some irresistible attraction. And one would come further than this to admire such a sight. Ah, I thought to myself, I understand this life of this man. He has made a world apart for himself in which he treasures all of his greatest wonders. For two whole hours, an aquatic army escorted the Nautilus. During their games, their bounds, while rivaling each other in beauty, brightness, and velocity, I distinguished the green labre, the banded mullet marked by the double line of black, the round-tailed goby of a white color with the violet spots on the back, the Japanese sculbris, a beautiful mackerel of these seas, which a blue-bodied silvery head, the brilliant azurors who 
whose name alone defies description. Some banded spares with variegated fins of blue and yellow, the woodcocks of the seas. Some specimens of which attain a yard in length. Japanese salamanders, spider lampreys, serpents six feet long with eyes small and lively and a huge mouse bristling with teeth and many other species. Our imagination was kept at its height. Interjections followed quickly on each other. Ned named the fish, Conseil clasped them. I was in ecstasies with the vivacity of their movements and the beauty of their forms. Never had it been given to me to surprise these animals alive and at liberty in their natural element. I will not mention all the varieties which passed before my dazzled eyes, all the collection of the seas of China and Japan. These fish, more numerous than the birds of the air, came attracted, no doubt, by the brilliant focus of the electrical light. Suddenly there was daylight by the saloon. The iron panels closed again, and the enchanting vision disappeared. But for a long time I dreamt on till my eyes fell on the instruments hanging on the partition. The compass still showed the course to be east-northeast, the manometer, manometer indicated a pressure of five atmospheres, equivalent to the depth of 25 fathoms, and the electric law gave a speed of 15 miles an hour. I expected Captain Nemo, but he did not appear. The clock marked the hour of five. Ned Land and Conseil returned to their cabin, and I retired to my chamber. My dinner was ready. I was composed. It was composed of turtle soup made of the most delicate hawksbills of a sir mullet served with puff paste, the liver of which, prepared by itself, was most delicious, and fillets of Emperor Holocanthus, the savor of which seemed to me superior even to salmon. I passed the evening reading, writing, and thinking, and then sleep overpowered me, and I stretched myself on the couch of Zostera and slept profoundly, whilst the Nautilus was glistening, gliding rapidly through the currents of the Black River. End of chapter 13. Chapter 14. A Note of Invitation The next day was the 9th of November. I awoke after a long sleep of twelve hours. Conseil came, according to custom, to know how I passed the night, and to offer his services. He had left his friend the Canadian sleeping like a man who had never done anything else all his life. I let the, well, the worthy fellow chatter as he pleased without caring to answer him. I was preoccupied by the absence of the captain during our sitting of the day before and hoping to see him today. As soon as I was dressed, I went into the saloon, and it was deserted. I plunged into the study of the shell treasures hidden behind the glasses. I reveled also in great herbals filled with the rarest marine plants, which, although dried up, retained their lively colors. Amongst these precious hydrophytes, I remarked with some uh, vorticelle, pavonere, delicate ceramics with scarlet tint, some fan-shaped agari, and some not the beauty, like flat mushrooms, which at one time used to be classed as zoophytes. In short, a perfect series of algae. The whole day passed without my being honored with by a visit from Captain Nemo. The panels of the saloon did not open. Perhaps they did not wish us to tire of these beautiful things. The course of the Nautilus was east northeast. her speed 12 knots, the depth below the surface between 25 and 30 fathoms. The next day, 10th of November, the same desertion, the same solitude. I did not see one of the ship's crew. Ned and Conseil spent the greater part of the day with me. They were astonished at this inexplicable absence of the captain. Was this singular man ill? Had he altered his intentions with regard to us? After all, as Conseil said, we enjoyed perfect liberty. We were delicately and abundantly fed. Our host kept to his terms of the treaty. We could not complain, and indeed the singularity of our fate reserved such wonderful compensation for us that we had no right to accuse it as yet. That day I commenced the journal of these adventures, which has enabled me to relate them with more scrupulous exactitude and minute detail. I wrote it on paper made from the Zostera Marina. 11th November, early in the morning. The fresh air spreading over the interior of the Nautilus told me that we had come to the surface of the ocean to renew our supply of oxygen. It, I directed my steps to the central staircase and mounted the platform. It was six o'clock, the weather was cloudy, the sea gray but calm, scarcely a billow. Captain Nemo, who I hoped to meet, would he be there? I saw no one but the steersman imprisoned in the glass cage. Seated upon the projection formed by the hull of the pinnacle, I inhaled the salt breeze with delight. By degrees, the fog disappeared under the action of the sun's rays. The 
radiant orb rose from behind the eastern horizon. The sea flamed under its glance like a train of gunpowder. The clouds scattered in the heights were colored with lively tints of beautiful shades and numerous mare's trails, which betokened wind for the day. But what was the wind to the Nautilus, which tempests could not frighten? I was admiring this joyous rising of the sun, so gay and so life-giving, when I heard steps approaching the platform. I was prepared to salute Captain Nemo, but it was his second, whom I had already seen on the captain's first visit, who appeared. He advanced on the platform, not seeming to see me. With his powerful glass to his eye, he scanned every point of the horizon with great attention. This, examin ocean, this examination over, he approached the panel and pronounced a sentence in exactly these terms. I have remembered it, for every morning it was repeated under exactly the same conditions, and it was thus worded. Not from Respach Lorni Verk. What it meant, I could not say. These words pronounced the second descended. I thought that the Nautilus was about to return to its submarine navigation. I regained the panel and returned to my chamber. Five days sped thus without any change in our situation. Every morning I mounted the platform. The same phrase was pronounced by the same individual, but Captain Nemo did not appear. I had made up my mind that I should never see him again when, on the 16th November, on returning to my room with Ned and Conseil, I found upon my table a note addressed to me. I opened it impatiently. Written in bold, clear hand, the characters rather pointed, recalling the German type. The note was worded as follows. 16th of November, 1867, to Professor Ahana on board the Nautilus, Captain Nemo invites Professor Ahana to a hunting party, which will take place tomorrow morning in the forests of the island of Crespo. He hopes that nothing will prevent the professor from being present, and he will, with pleasure, see him joined by his companions. Captain Nemo, commander of the Nautilus. A hunt! exclaimed Ned. And in the forests of the island of Crespo, added Conseil. Oh, then the gentleman is going on terra firma, replied Ned Land. That seems to me to be clearly indicated, said I, reading the letter once more. Well, we must accept, said the Canadian, but once more on dry land we shall know what to do. Indeed, I shall not be sorry to eat a piece of fresh venison. Without seeking to reconcile what was contradictory between... Captain Nemo's manifest aversion to islands, continents, and his invitation to hunt in a forest, I contented myself with replying, Let us see where the island of Crespo is. I consulted the planisphere, and in 30 degrees, 40, uh, 40 minutes north latitude, and 157 degrees, 50 minutes west longitude, I found a small island recognized in 1801 by Captain Crespo and marked in the ancient Spanish maps as Roca de la Plata, meaning the Silver Rock. We were then about 1,800 miles from our starting point, and the course of the Nautilus, a, a little change, was bringing it back towards the southeast. I showed this little rock lost in the midst of the North Pacific to my companions. If Captain Nemo does sometimes go on dry land, said I, he at least chooses desert islands. Ned Land shrugged his shoulders without speaking in Conseil, and he left me. After supper, which was served by the steward, mute and impassive, I went to bed, but without some, not without some anxiety. The next morning, the 17th of November, on wakening, I felt that the Nautilus was perfectly still. I dressed quickly and entered the salon, saloon. Captain Nemo was there, waiting for me. He rose, bowed, and asked me if it was convenient for me to accompany him, and he made no allusion to his absence during the last eight days. I did not mention it, and simply answered that my companions and myself were ready to follow him. We entered the dining room, where breakfast was served. Monsieur Ahana, said the captain, pray share my breakfast without ceremony. We will chat as we eat, for though I promised you a walk in the forest, I did not undertake to find hotels there, so breakfast as a man who will like, most likely not have his dinner till very late. I did honor to the repast. It was composed of several kinds of fish and slices of halothurite, ex excellent zoophytes, and different sorts of seaweed. Our drink consisted of pure water, to which the captain added some drops of a fermented liqueur extracted by the Kamshatcha method, uh, from a seaweed known under the name of Rodominia palmata, 
Captain Nemo ate at first without saying a word, then he began. Sir, when I proposed you to hunt in my submarine forest of Crespo, you evidently thought me mad. Sir, you should never judge lightly of any man. But Captain, believe me, be kind enough to listen, and then you will see whether you have any chance to accuse me of folly and contradiction. I listen. You know as well as I do, Professor, that man can live underwater, providing he carries with him a sufficient supply of breathable air. In submarine works, the workman, clad in an impervious dress, with his head in a metal helmet, receives air from above by means of forcing pumps and regulators. That is a diving apparatus, said I. Just so, but under these conditions the man is not at liberty. He is attached to the pump, which sends him air through an India rubber tube, and if we are obliged to be thus held to the Nautilus, we could not go far. And the means of getting free? I asked. It is to use the Roquayro. Roquayro. Roquayro apparatus, invented by two of your own countrymen, which I have brought to perfection for my own use, and which will allow you to risk yourself under these new physiological conditions without any organ whatsoever suffering. It consists of a reservoir of thick iron plates in which I store the air under a pressure of 50 atmospheres. The reservoir is fixed on the back by means of braces, like a soldier's knapsack. Its upper part forms a box in which air is kept by means of a bellows and therefore cannot escape unless at normal tension. It is the Rokoiro apparatus such as we use to India rubber pipes. Leave this box and join a sort of tent which holds the nose and mouth. One is to introduce fresh air and the other to let out the fowl, and the tongue closes one or the other according to the wants of the respirator. But I, in encountering great pressures at the bottom of the sea, was obliged to shut my head, like that of a diver in a ball of copper, and it is to this ball of copper that the two pipes, the inspirator and the expirator, open. Perfectly, Captain Nemo, but the air that you carry with you soon must be used. When it only contains 15% of oxygen, it is no longer fit to breathe. Right, but I told you, Monsieur Arhenard, that the pump of the Nautilus allow me to store the air under considerable pressure, and on those conditions the reservoir of the apparatus can furnish breathable air for nine or ten hours. I have no further objections to make. I will only ask you one thing, Captain. How can you light your road at the bottom of the sea? With the Romkoff apparatus, Monsieur Ahana, one is carried on the back, the other is fastened to the waist. It is composed of a Bunsen pile, which I do not work with be which I do not work with bichromate or potash, but with sodium. A wire is introduced which collects the electricity produced and directs it towards a particularly made lantern. In this lantern is a spiral glass which contains a small quantity of carbonic gas. When the apparatus is at work with this gas, becomes luminous, giving out a white and continuous light. Thus provided, I can breathe and I can see. Captain Nemo, to all my objections you make such crushing answers that I dare no longer doubt. But if I am forced to admit the Roquayro and Rubkoff apparatus, I must be allowed some reservations with regard to the gun I am to carry. But it is not a gun for powder. Then it is an air gun. Doubtless. How would you have me manufacture gunpowder on board without either saltpeter, sulfur, or charcoal? Besides, to fire underwater in a medium 855 times denser than the air, we must cause a very considerable resistance. That would be no difficulty. There exist guns, according to Fulton, perfected in England by Philip Coles and Burley, in France by Fursi, and in Italy by Landy, which are, fr are furnished with a peculiar system of closing, which can fire under these conditions. But I repeat, having no powder, I use air under great pressure, which the pumps of the Nautilus furnish abundantly. But this air must be rapidly used? Well... Have I not my Rokoyo Reservoir, which can refurnish it at need? A tap is all that is required. Besides, Monsieur Ahanor, you must see yourself during our submarine hunt. We can spend but little air and but few balls. But it seems to me that in this twilight, in the midst of this fluid, which is very dense compared with the atmosphere, shots could not go far, nor prove, nor easily prove mortal. Sir, on the contrary, with this gun every blow is mortal, and however lightly the animal is touched, it falls as if struck by a thunderbolt. Why? 
because the balls sent by this gun are not ordinary balls, but little cases of glass, invented by Linia Book, an Austrian chemist, of which I have a large supply. These glass cases are covered with a case of steel and weighted with a pellet of lead. They are real laden bottles into which the electricity is forced to such a very high tension. With the slightest shock, they are discharged and the animal, however strong it may be, falls dead. I must tell you that the cases are size number four and the charges for an ordinary gun would be ten. I will no longer argue, I replied, rising from the table. I have nothing left but to take my gun. At all events, I will go where you go. Captain Nemo then led me aft, and in passing before Ned and Conseil's cabin, I called my two companions, who followed immediately. We then came to a kind of cell near the machinery room, in which we put on our walking dress. End of chapter 14. Annie, 116, 1195, and Farmer Bob, 73. Good points. Next race, play to play. While this battle's running, I'm going to run to the restroom. Get your balls on the track. Get your balls on the track. Type exclamation point play. Welcome in, Loner Pig. Oop, those are not the right headphones today. All right. Again, we're running half-hour maps, um, and we'll do some, some four-minute maps when we get done with our reading segment, um, which is about half an hour, and then we will do cleanups after that for anybody who is marble grinding. All right, next battle is up. Next race is up. Two minutes on the clock. Play to play if you want to get in there. And um, so we're uh, we're gonna go hunt in a forest in the book. Um, it was just a, he, you know. I mean, a lot of this is Captain Nemo just explaining to him like how they do things, right? You know, they're gonna have this special suit that's gonna allow them eight to nine hours worth of air. They can expend a little bit of air with a touch of a button, basically, to shoot these little like electricity lead steel glass balls. Um, at things to instantly down whatever the animal is. Um, and so they're going to go for a hunt. Uh, we got about probably two more, two more chapters worth uh, to read tonight, and then we'll end our reading section. We typically try to start our reading about 15 to 20 minutes into the stream and then we read for about two hours on Tuesdays stream will go a little bit longer um, but we've tried to read for about two hours so chapter 15 a walk on the bottom of the sea this cell was to speak correctly the arsenal and wardrobe of the Nautilus 
A dozen diving apparatus hung from the partition waiting our use. Ned Land, on seeing them, showed evident repugnance to dress himself in one. But my worthy Ted, the forests on the island of Crespo are nothing but submarine forests. Good, said the disappointed harpooner, who saw his dreams of fresh meat fade away. And you, Monsieur Ahana, are you going to dress yourself in these clothes? There is no alternative, Master Ned. Ooh. Raiders. Raiders. Welcome in, guys. Sorry, the alerts are off. Snooze button. We love snooze button in this house. Oh man, you know what? I think I might have turned off the the shout out too. Yeah, let me go turn on the shout out real quick. Readers of the Awesome Slevin. <laughs> so excited to hear some 20,000 leagues. Yeah, well, we, uh, man, there's some words in here, huh? There's some words in here. <laughs> we're doing well. What were you reading? What were you guys reading? Or what are you reading tonight? I know Tuesday a lot of times is your reading. Guys, if you don't know um, Snooze Button, like, man, heck of a fun time. Uh, they're a streaming family as well. Um, and uh, just play some really cool games, including Spirit Fair, which they finished recently, which has been on our list. In fact, Steam is telling me that that should be one of the next four games I play, but, you know, we never listen. They're also playing Ooblets right now, which seems to be a lot of fun. Um, love science terms. That's him for sure. Yeah, it's very dry. It's very dry. White Fang tonight. Ah, still the Jack London. Yes. I do recommend Spirit Fair for sure. Yeah, I've had it downloaded for a while. I, you know, I would come in and like look at what you were doing, but trying not to like pay too much attention, just listen to your voice. Because Snooze Button TV's got a great voice, guys. So I mean, not only are the reading streams great, but just when they're just playing games and talking in general. So, you know, go hang out, bring the tissues. Yeah, yeah. Um, we we tend to love some games that take us on some emotional roller coasters here. <laughs> you know, like. Try to say only wholesome games, but then like next thing we know, like a dog's dying or a kid's getting sick or something like that. We're all just like <sighs> voices like melted butter on fresh warm bread and plenty of melted butter too, right? It's not spread thin. It's thick. It's thick. Um, have you played Rakuin? That's interesting that you mentioned that one because I also have that downloaded right now on my it's on my desktop. Uh, and I Yep, there it is right there. Little weird looking head for an icon. Melted butter with honey. That's that's pretty good, yeah. All right. Um so Rakuin's a, a good one then. Or is it just, you know, exactly like what I said, you know? Um, welcome in, guys. Welcome in, Raiders. Uh, we probably got about another 20 minutes or so of reading stream. Uh, you know, we try to do about two hours, but we don't start right away when we stream. So, yes, we cried a lot, but it was beautiful. Uh, good a good cry is dry cleaning for the soul. Why says computer time is done because I can't elevate my foot properly when typing. You could show her. Just turn yourself upside down and get to it. Um, enjoy the lurk and enjoy the lurk. Thank you, Light Source. All right, guys, we're going to get back into it. Snooze Button, thank you so much. Guys, go follow and hang out with Snooze Button. A lot of fun. I'm pretty bad at getting into her, her stream raider battles, but uh, but I'm good at hanging out and lurking. <laughs> All right. Uh, we were just at the beginning of this chapter, so we'll just restart the three or four lines we read. Chapter 15. A Walk on the Bottom of the Sea. This cell was, to speak correctly, the arsenal and wardrobe of the Nautilus. A dozen diving apparatus hung from the partition waiting our use. Ned Land, on seeing them, showed evident repugnance to dress himself in one. 
But my worthy Ted, the forests of the island of Crespo are nothing but submarine forests. Good, said the disappointed harpooner, who saw his dreams of fresh meat fade away. And you, Monsieur Ahada, are you going to dress yourself in these clothes? There is no alternative, Master Ned. As you please, sir, replied the harpooner, shrugging his shoulders. But as for me, unless I am forced, I will never get into one. No one will force you, Master Ned, said Captain Nemo. Is Conseil going to risk it? Asked Ted. Asked Ned. I follow where my master wherever he goes, replied Conseil. At the captain's call, two of the ship's crew came to help us to dress in these heavy and impervious clothes made of India rubber without seam and constructed expressly to resist considerable pressure. One would have thought it a suit of armor, both supple and resisting. This suit formed trousers and waistcoat. The trousers were finished off with thick boots, weighted with heavy leaden soles. The surface of the waistcoat was held together by bands of copper, which crossed the chest, protecting it from the great pressure of the water and leaving the lungs free to act. The sleeves ended in gloves, which in no way restrained the movement of the hands. There was a vast difference notable between these consummate apparatuses and the old cork breastplates, jackets, and other contrivances in rogue during the 18th century. Captain Nemo and one of his companions, a sort of Hercules who must have possessed great strength, Conseil and myself were soon enveloped in the dresses. There remained nothing more to be done but to enclose our heads in the metal box. But before proceeding to this operation, I asked the captain's permission to examine the guns we were to carry. One of the Nautilus men gave me a simple gun, the butt end of which, made of steel, hollow in the center, was rather large. It served as a reservoir for compressed air, which a valve, worked by a spring, allowed to escape into a metal tube. A box of projectiles in a groove in the thickness of the butt contained about 20 of these electric balls, which, by means of a spring, were forced into the barrel of the gun. As soon as one shot was fired, another was ready. Captain Nemo, said I, this arm is perfect and easily handled. I only ask to be allowed to try it, but but how shall we gain the bottom of the sea? At this moment, Professor, the Nautilus is stranded in five fathoms, and we have nothing to do but to start. But, but how shall we get off? You shall see. Captain Nemo thrust his head into the helmet. Conseil and I did the same, not without hearing an ironical good sport from the Canadian. The upper part of our dress terminated in a copper collar upon which was screwed the metal helmet. Three holes protected by thick glass allowed us to see in all directions by simply turning our head in the interior of the headdress. As soon as it was in position, the roquoil apparatus on our backs began to act, and for my part, I could breathe with ease. With the Rumkorf lamp hanging from my belt and the gun in my hand, I was ready to set out. But to speak the truth, imprisoned in these heavy garments and glued to the deck by my leaden soles, it was impossible for me to take a step. By, but this state of things was provided for. I, I felt myself being pushed into a little room contiguous to the wardrobe room. My companions followed, towed along in the same way. I heard a watertight door furnished with, with stopper plates close upon us, and we were wrapped in profound darkness. After some minutes, a loud hissing was heard. I felt the cold mount from my feet to my chest, evidently from some part of the vessel they had by means of a tap, given entrance to the water which was invading us, and with which the room was soon filled. A second door, cut into the side of the Nautilus, then opened. We saw a faint light. In another instant, our feet trod the bottom of the sea. And now, how can I retrace the impression left upon me by that walk under the waters? Words are impotent to relate such wonders. Captain Nemo walked in front. His companion followed some steps behind. Conseil and I remained near each other as if in... An exchange of words had been possible through our metallic cases. I no longer felt the weight of my clothing, or of my shoes, or of my reservoir of air, or my thick helmet. In the midst of my head rattled like an almond in its shell. The light 
which lit the soil 30 feet below the surface of the ocean, astonished me by its power. The solar rays shone through the watery mass easily and dissipated all color, and I clearly distinguished objects at a distance of 150 yards. Beyond that, the tents darkened into fine gradations of ultramarine and faded into vague obscurity. Truly, this water which surrounded me was but another air denser than the terrestrial atmosphere, but almost as transparent. Above me was the calm surface of the sea. We were walking on fine, even sand, not wrinkled, as on a flat shore which retains the impression of the billows. This dazzling carpet, really a reflector, repelled the rays of the sun with wonderful intensity, which accounted for the vibration which penetrated every atom of liquid. Shall I, believed when I, shall I be believed when I say that at the depth of thirty feet I could see as if I was in broad daylight? For a quarter of an hour I trod on this sand, sown with the impalpable dust of shells. The hull of the Nautilus, resembling a long shoal, disappeared by degrees, but its lantern, when darkness should overtake us in the waters, would help us guide, to guide us on board by its distinct rays. Soon, forms of objects outlined in the distance were discernible. I recognized magnificent rocks hung with a tapestry of zoophytes of the most beautiful kind, and was at first struck by the peculiar effect of this medium. It was then ten in the morning. The rays of the sun struck the surface of the waves at rather an oblique angle, and at the touch of their light decomposed by refraction as though a prism. Flowers, rocks, plants, shells, and polypi were shaded at the edges by several seven solar colors. It was marvelous. A feast for the eyes, this complication of colored tints, a perfect kaleidoscope of green, yellow, orange, violet, indigo, and blue in one word, the whole palette of an enthusiastic colorist. Why could I not communicate to Conseil the lively sensations which were mounting to my brain and rival him in exp expressions of admiration for Thought I knew Captain Nemo and his companion might be able to exchange thoughts by means of signs previously agreed upon. So, for want of better, I talked to myself. I declaimed the copper box which covered my head, thereby expending more air in vain words than was perhaps expedient. Various kinds of isis, clusters of pure tuft coral, prickly fungi, and anemones formed a brilliant garden of flowers enameled with porphyte decked with their collarettes of blue tentacles, sea stars studding the sandy bottom together with asterophytons like fine lace embroidered by the hands of naids, whose festoons were waved by the gentle undulations caused by our walks. It was a real grief to me to crush under my feet the brilliant specimens of mollusks which strewed the, gra which strewed the grounds by thousands of hammerheads, donacea, veritable bouncing, bounding shells of, of staircases and red helmet shells, angelic wings, and many other produced by this inexhaustible ocean. But we were bound to walk, so we went on whilst above our hells waved shoals of physolates, leaving their tentacles to float in their train. Medusa, whose umbrella of opal or rose pink, escalloped with a band of blue, sheltered us from the rays of the sun and fiery Pelagay which, in the darkness, would have strewn our path with a phosphorescent light. All these wonders I saw in the space of a quarter of a mile, scarcely stopping, and following Captain Nemo, who beckoned me on by signs. Soon the nature of the soil changed. To the sandy plain succeeded an extent of slimy mud, which the Americans call ooze, composed of equal parts of silicious and calcareous shells. We then traveled over a plain of seaweed of wild and luxuriant vegetation. This sward was of close texture and soft to the feet and rivaled the softest carpet woven by the hand of men. But whilst verdure was spread at our feet, it did not abandon our heads. A light network of marine plants of that inexhaustible family of seaweeds of which more than 2,000 kinds are grown grew on the surface of the water. I saw long ribbons of fucus uh, floating, some globular, other tuberous. Lord and Cier and Cladistephi, 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 of most delicate foliage, and some Rhodomine palmate, resembling the fan of a cactus. 
I noticed that the green plants kept near the top of the sea whilst the red were at a greater depth, leaving it to the black and brown hydrophytes to take care of forming gardens and patiers in the remote beds of the ocean. We had quitted the Nautilus about half an hour. It was near noon. I knew by the perpendicularity of the sun's rays, which were no longer refracted, the magical colors disappeared by degrees and the shades of emerald and sapphire were defaced. We walked with a regular step, which rang upon the ground with astonishing intensity. The slightest noise was transmitted with a quickness to which the ear was unaccustomed on the earth. Indeed, water is a better conductor of sound than air in the ratio of four to one. And at this period, the earth sloped downwards. The light took a uniform tint. We are at a depth of 105 yards and 20 inches, undergoing a pressure of six atmospheres. At this depth, I could still see the rays of the sun, though feebly. To their intense brilliancy had succeeded a reddish twilight, the lowest state between day and night, but we could still see well enough. It was not necessary to resort to the Rumkorf apparatus as yet. At this moment, Captain Nemo stopped. He waited till I joined him and then pointed to an obscure mass looming in the shadow at a short distance. It is the forest of the island of Crespo, thought I, and I was not mistaken. End of chapter 15. We're going to read probably one more chapter, guys, and that's probably where we're going to stop for the evening. Uh, we'll continue stream for a little bit longer, um, but this will probably be the last reading chapter. Chapter 16. A Submarine Forest. We had at last arrived on the borders of this forest, doubtless one of the finest of Captain Nemo's immense domains. He looked upon at his own, and considered he had the same right over it the same first men had in the first days of the world. And indeed, who would have disputed with him the possession of this submarine property? What other hardier pioneer would come, hatchet in hand, to cut down the dark copses? This forest was composed of large tree plants, and the moment we penetrated under its vast arcades, I was struck by the singular position of their branches, a position I had not yet observed. Not a herb which carpeted the ground, not a branch with the clothed the trees was either broken or bent, nor did they extend horizontally, all stretched up to the surface of the ocean. Not a filament, not a ribbon, however thin they might be, but kept as straight as a rod of iron. The fusai and alianas grew in rigid, perpendicular lines due to the density of the element which had produced them. Motionless, yet when bent to one side by the hand, they directly resumed their former position. Truly, it was a region of perpendicularity. I soon accustomed myself to this fantastic position as well as to the comparative darkness which surrounded us. The soil of the forest seemed covered with sharp blocks, difficult to avoid. The submarine flora struck me as being very perfect and richer even than it would have been in the Arctic or tropical zones where these productions are not so plentiful. But for some minutes, I voluntarily confounded the genera, taking zoophytes for hydrophytes, animals for plants, and who would not have been mistaken? The fauna and the flora are too closely allied in the submarine world. These plants are self-propagated, and the principle of their existence is in the water which upholds and nourishes them. The greater number, instead of leaves, shot forth blades of capricious shapes comprised within a scale of colors. Pink, carmine, green, olive, fawn, brown... I saw there, but not dried up, as our specimens of the Nautilus are. Pavanari spread like a fan, as if to catch the breeze. Scarlet ceramis, whose laminaries extended their edible shoots of fern-shaped neriocysti, which grow to a height of fifteen feet, clusters of acetabuli, acetabuli, acetabuli whose stems increase in size upwards, and numbers of other marine plants, all devoid of flowers. Curious anomaly, fantastic element, said an ingenious naturalist, in which the animal kingdom blossoms and the vegetable does not. Under these numerous shrubs, as large as trees of the temperate zone, and under their damp shadow, which mass were massed together, real bushes of living flowers, hedges of zoophytes, on which blossomed some zebra meandrines, 
with crooked groves, some yellow caryophyllae. And to complete the illusion, the fish flies flew from branch to branch like a swarm of hummingbirds, whilst yellow lep... Mm, okay. Lepisa compthi. Lepisa compthi. Lepisa compthi. Whilst yellow lepisacompthi with bristling jaws, dacleopteri and monocynthrites rose at our feet like a flight of snipes. In about an hour, Captain Nemo gave the signal to halt. I, for my part, was not sorry, and we stretched ourselves under the arbor of Aleri, the long, thin blades of which stood up like arrows. This short rest seemed delicious to me. There was nothing wanting but the charm of conversation. But impossible to speak, impossible to answer. I only put my great copper head to Conseil's. I saw the worthy fellow's eyes glistening with delight, and to show his satisfaction, he shook himself in his breastplate of air in the most comical way in the world. After four hours of this walking, I was surprised not to find myself dreadfully hungry. How to account for the state of stomach I could not tell, but instead I felt an insurmountable desire to sleep, which happens to all divers, and my eyes soon closed behind the thick glasses, and I fell into a heavy slumber which the movement alone had prevented before. Captain Nemo and his robust companion, stretched in the clear crystal, set us the example. How long I remained buried in this drowsiness I cannot judge, but when I woke, the sun seemed sinking towards the horizon. Captain Nemo had already risen, and I was beginning to stretch my limbs, when an unexpected apparition brought me briskly to my feet. A few steps off, a monstrous sea spider, about thirty-eight inches high, was watching me with squinting eyes ready to spring upon me. Though my diver's dress was thick enough to defend me from the bite of this animal, I could not help shuddering with horror. Conseil and the sailor of the Nautilus awoke at this moment, and Captain Nego pointed out the hideous crustacean, which a blow from the butt end of the gun knocked over, and I saw the horrible claws of the monster writhe in terrible convulsions. This accident reminded me that other animals, more to be feared, might haunt these obscure depths against whose attacks my diving dress would not protect me. I had never thought of it before, but I now resolved to be upon my guard. Indeed, I thought that this halt would mark the termination of our walk, but I was mistaken, for instead of returning to the Nautilus, Captain Nemo continued his bold excursion. The ground was still on its incline, its declivity seeming to get greater, and to be leading us to greater depths. It must have been about three o'clock when we reached a narrow valley between high perpendicular walls situated about 75 fathoms deep. Thanks to the perfection of our apparatus, we were 45 fathoms below the limit to which nature seems to have imposed on a man as to his submarine excursions. I say 75 fathoms, though I had no instrument by which to judge the distance. But I knew that even in the clearest waters, the solar rays could not penetrate further, and accordingly the darkness deepened. At ten paces, not an object was visible. I was groping my way when I suddenly saw a brilliant white light. Captain Nemo had just put his electric apparatus into use. His companion did the same, and Conseil and I followed their example. By turning a screw, I established communication between the wire and the spiral glass, and the sea, lit by our four lanterns, was illuminated for a circle of thirty-six yards. <laughs> Captain Nemo was still plunging into the dark depths of the forest, whose trees was getting scarce, scarcer at every step. I, I noticed that vegetable life disappeared sooner than animal life. The Medusae had already abandoned the arid soil, from which a great number of animals, zoophytes, articulata, mollusks, and fishes still obtained sustenance. As we walked, I thought the light of our Rumkarf apparatus could not fail to draw some inhabitant from its dark couch. But if they did approach us, they at least kept at a respectful distance from the hunters. Several times I saw Captain Nemo stop, put his gun to his shoulder, and after some moments drop it and walk on. At last, after about four hours, this marvelous excursion came to an end. A wall of superb rocks and an imposing mass rose before us, a heap of gigantic blocks and enormous steep granite shore forming dark grottos, but which represented no practical slope. It was the prop of the island of Crespo. It was the Earth! 
Captain Nemo stopped suddenly. A gesture of his brought us all to a halt, and however desirous I might be to scale the wall, I was obliged to stop. Here ended Captain Nemo's domains, and he would not go beyond them. Further on was a portion of the globe he might not trample upon. The return began. Captain Nemo had returned to the head of this little band, directing their course without hesitation. I thought we were not following the same road to return to the Nautilus. The new road was very steep and consequently very painful. We approached the surface of the sea rapidly, but this return to the upper strata was not so sudden as to cause relief from the pressure too rapidly, which might have produced serious disorder in our organization and brought on internal lesions so fatal to divers. Very soon, light reappeared and grew, and the sun be being low on the horizon, the refraction edged the different objects with a spectral ring. At ten yards and a half deep, we walked amidst a shoal of little fishes of all kinds, more numerous than the birds of the air, and also more agile, but no aquatic game worthy of a shot had as yet met our gaze, and when at that moment I saw the captain shoulder his gun quickly and follow a moving object into the shrubs, he fired. I heard a slight hissing and a creature fell stunned at some distance from us. It was a magnificent sea otter, and in Hydrus, the only exclusively marine quadruped. This otter was five feet long and must have been very valuable. Its skin, chestnut brown above and silvery underneath, would have made one of those beautiful furs so sought after in the Russian and Chinese markets. The fineness and the luster of its coat would certainly fetch 80 pounds. I admired this curious animal with its rounded head ornamented with short ears, its round eyes and white whiskers like those of a cat, with webbed feet and nails and tufted tail. This precious animal, hunted and tracked by fishermen, has now become very rare and taken refuge chiefly in the northern parts of the Pacific, or probably its race would soon become extinct. Captain Nemo's companion took the beast, threw it over his shoulder, and we continued our journey for one hour, a plain of sand lay stretched beneath us, before us, sir. For one hour, a plain of sand lay stretched before us. Sometimes it rose to within two yards and some inches of the surface of the water. I then saw our image clearly reflected, drawn inversely, and above us appeared an identical group reflecting our movements and our actions. In a word, like us in every point, except that they walked with their heads downward and their feet in the air. Another effect I noticed, which was the passage of thick clouds, which formed and vanished rapidly, but on reflection, I understood that these seeming clouds were due to the varying thickness of the reeds at the bottom, and I could even see the fleecy foam, which their broken tops multiplied on the water, and the shadows of large birds passing above our heads, whose rapid flight I could discern on the surface of the sea. On this occasion, I was witness to one of the finest gunshots which ever made the nerves of a hunter thrill. A large bird of great breadth and wing, clearly visible, approached, hovering over us. Captain Nemo's companion shouldered his gun and fired when it was only a few yards above the waves. The creature fell stunned, and the force of its fall brought it within reach of the dexterous hunter's grab. It was an albatross of the finest kind. Our march had not been interrupted by this incident. For two hours, we followed these sandy plains. Then fields of algae, very disagreeable to cross. Candidly, I could do no more when I saw a glimmer of light which, for half a mile, broke the darkness of the waters. It was the lantern of the Nautilus. Before twenty minutes we were, o were over, we should be on board, and I should be able to breathe with ease, for it seemed that my reservoir supplied air very deficient in oxygen. But I did not reckon on an accidental meeting which delayed our arrival for some time. I had remained some steps behind when I presently saw Captain Nemo coming hurriedly towards me. With his strong hand, he bent me to the ground, his companion doing the same to Conseil. At first, I did not know what to think of this sudden attack, but I was soon reassured by seeing the captain lie down beside me and remain unmovable. I saw stretched on the ground, just on the shelter of a bush of algae, when, raising my head, I saw some enormous mass, casting phosphoric gleams pass blusteringly by. My blood froze in my veins as I recognized two formidable sharks which threatened us. It was a couple of tentoreas, terrible creatures, with enormous tails and a dull, glassy stay, stare. The phosphorescent matter ejected from holes pierced around the muzzle, monstrous brutes. 
which would crush a, a whole man in their iron jaws. I did not know whether Conseil stopped to classify them for my part. I noticed their silver bellies and their huge mouths bristling with teeth from a very unscientific point of view and more as a possible victim than as a naturalist. Happily, the voracious creatures did not see very well. They passed without seeing us, brushing us with their brownish fins, and we escaped by a miracle from a danger certainly greater than meeting a tiger full face in the forest. Half an hour after, guided by the electric light, we reached the Nautilus. The captain, uh, sorry, the outside door had been left open, and Captain Nemo closed it as soon as we had entered the first cell. He then pressed a knob. I heard the pumps working in the midst of the vessel. I felt the water sinking from around me, and in a few moments, the cell was entirely empty. The inside door was open, and we entered the vestry. There, our diving dress was taken off, not without some trouble, and fairly worn out from want of food or sleep, I returned to my room in great wonder at the surprising excursion at the bottom of the sea. End of chapter 16. Not a lot of dialogue in that one, but uh, definitely a lot of work. Uh, Des getting 103, Annie getting 84. And Misha getting 66. Great job on the races, guys. Uh, what's going on, Sunder? Thank you for the joke. I, uh, I appreciate that. Uh, play to play. Oh, wait a minute. Nope, hold on, sorry. Let's take that back. Let's take that back. It's lies, it's lies. Don't do it. Don't do it. It's lies. I enjoy all dad jokes. Uh, sorry, sorry, that was a lie. That was a lie. Don't do it. We're gonna run a couple. We're gonna we're gonna run our our favorite our current favorite map because we are coming out of the reading. Unplay to not play. There you go. No play. There you go. All right, now you guys play to play. Big Esh Lant and Abzi Rabzi got the uh, the bone eye. We move on to another battle. Uh, this is a regular gold, but then we have a loyalty uh, silver and a loyalty skin following up on this battle. So let's drop a cock. Balls on the track, cocks on the map. As a famous poet once said, I believe his name was Farmer Bob. All right, so get your balls in with an exclamation point play. Um, and get your balls on the, uh, get your paws rewind to what? Um, so that was the end of chapter 16. Um, and we, we, we did about what we did last time, which was about 45 pages. Um, which is going to mean that we got four more readings. Balls on the track, cocks on the map. You know, your rooster. Your 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 rogue. The 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 Slevin cock. The rooster rogue. <laughs> um All right, guys. So, what did you think of this reading? Uh did you like it? Was it good? I I honestly this it I haven't read this book since, you know, a wee lad and um, I, I don't think I, I don't think I love the the pacing of Jules Verne. I don't think I love the pacing of the Jules Verne, but it, but it is an adventure, and it's different than other books. Like I was talking before, because it's not a classic protagonist over antagonist. It's an adventure. It's an adventure. Uh, in, an, in an epic sense, a more technical version of a, an odyssey or, you know, something of that nature. So, um, yeah, we're done reading today, Sunder. Uh, we will be finishing, um, well, not finishing, but we will be reading more next Tuesday. Um, so I appreciate anybody that was hanging out and listening. <laughs> 